Welcome to That's All I Have to Say About That 3D, where we cover all perspectives on the issues. Today, we're talking about oil. So let's start going Republican. Ah, <sighs> oil. That resource that America is more comfortable invading other countries for than drilling in our own wildlife preserves. Sorry, Fallujah, but this bear migration trail has to be maintained. So, why are we talking about oil today? Well, because Donald Trump has some, well, different ideas regarding oil that might either put the U.S. in a very advantageous position or sink half the country under a rising sea level. Or then again, all of the above. All right, so what is Donald Trump saying about oil? Uh, President Trump has said he wants to make America the dominant energy producer. It is insane how quickly we've shifted from energy independence to energy dominance. We're like that guy who gets a new hobby, buys all the most expensive equipment, and then claims to be the best at it. Which, while that might only sound like a surface level analogy, really is deeper than a Saudi Arabian oil reserve. According to Bloomberg News, CNN Money, and many other equally reputable sources, the US could become the largest oil producer this year. Now first I need to clarify something. There is a large difference between a producer and an exporter. It's the difference between a marijuana dispensary and a drug dealer who is always out of inventory, and if you take one whiff near him, you'll know exactly why. Being a large oil producer means that, obviously, you produce a lot of oil. Glad we got that one straightened out. That said, if you use it all, it doesn't really matter and give you the energy dominance imagined by Donald Trump, just the energy independence imagined by Obama. Now, to get you to be a large oil exporter, you have to be producing a lot of oil, not using it, and selling it to other countries. Meaning that there are only two ways of achieving oil dominance. Either cutting consumption or increasing production. And with oil men running the EPA, Department of Energy, and State Departments, I think we're more likely to see a Donald Trump apology than a decrease in oil consumption. So, this leaves us with production increases. Now to understand our current position, we need to travel back to late 2014 when the headline was... There's been quite a shift in strategy, Michael, here. OPEC has always been the guarantor of the oil markets. Uh, when oil prices decide to fall, they usually cut production and lift prices up higher. The complete about change in the strategy going forward. This was a statement to global markets and a statement to the U.S. shale producers. And the Man, America is trapped in 1970s nostalgia right now. Whether it's OPEC throwbacks, Russia actually posing a threat to our democracy, rebooting MacGyver, or heck, even just trying to make America great again. I assume that the first time that was the 1970s, but who knows. Anyways, it's 2014 and there are low oil prices. Why is that a problem? I mean, I like paying less for things. Do we really need to get scared over every change? Well, OPEC's failure to agree new limits on oil production regardless of demand and tumbling prices is seen by some as a deliberate move to send rival producers to the wall. Reports say many shale companies are defaulting on their loans because the oil prices plunged below break-even point. Most people view the lowering of prices to be a pretty direct attack on American shale producers. Like how if I didn't want other people to produce humorous news analysis, I would flood the market to the point where demand was satiated and any excess analysis wouldn't be worth making. Now this is what OPEC was trying to do, with the goal that American shale would close up shop and leave the Organization of Petroleum Exporting Countries to be the primary supplier of oil. And while this kinda worked, when OPEC finally ramped up their production at the end of 2016, they had succeeded in the same way that George Bush had succeeded when he stood proudly on that aircraft carrier in 2003 and declared, Mission accomplished. Because... It was late 2016 and OPEC producers reached the first deal to cut production since the financial crisis. Prices quickly rebounded above $50 a barrel, but it wasn't long before those efforts to reassure markets was overpowered by a tug of war between two competing factors. Output curbs by OPEC plus 11 producers outside of the cartel, including Russia, and on the other hand, a resurgent US shale industry that has ramped up its production. They had successfully raised the prices, but mere hours after the prices went up, it was realized that the US shale oil production hadn't died only been hibernating. And even worse for OPEC, we had actually been improving. 
You see, that's the one thing about America. No matter how environmentally terrible, economically irrational, unsustainable, or danger it is, there is no way you're going to stop us from drilling into the ground and getting those sweet, sweet fossil fuels. Instead, because the prices were so low, our shale companies got smarter and leaner. It isn't any longer. And one day he was shooting at some food, and up through the ground come a bubbling crude. Oil, that is, black gold. A method that lasted a surprisingly long time. Now, because of smart technologies and new drilling strategies, we can dig deeper, and it takes a lot less luck than just pot shotting rural Texas and hoping for the best. So this brings us to today, where, through grit and innovation, our shale companies lasted the storm and prices have gone back up. The last October, American imports were 2.5 million barrels a day. Now, that might sound ludicrously high considering more than a million of anything per day sounds pretty absurd. This was the lowest rate of imports since 1973. And, hmm. What could have been lowering our imports in 1973? The Middle East War produced developments all over the world today. The oil producing countries of the Arab world decided to use their oil as a political weapon. They will reduce oil production by 5% a month until the Israelis withdraw from occupied territories. Alright, so our imports were lower in 1973, but not because of anything proactive that we had done, but because we were in political timeout for supporting Israel. So this is all to say, we haven't had these oil imports this low in a long time. Additionally, the US government forecasts that the nation's production will climb to 11 million barrels a day by late 2019, a level that would rival Russia, the world's top producer. Furthermore, our oil exports will soon rival those of Russia, and look at that percent of oil exports. My gosh, their exports are about as diverse as the Trump voter base. The potential that America could export more than Russia is huge. It's like finding out your country can beat China in making humans, or Greece in producing debt. So this brings up two questions in my mind. First, why is this good? I mean, most people probably couldn't even imagine the US suddenly becoming one of the largest exporters and producers of oil after decades of talk about just energy independence. First, this is kind of perfect for any America first diplomats who really, really did want to have to deal with the Middle East, but they can disregard them now because they no longer control a pretty crucial mechanism to our economic future. Another key piece to this puzzle is having the ability to control the price of oil without being constrained by OPEC agreements. We can also use this as a major punishment for countries like Russia and other OPEC nations. You saw that more than 50% of Russian exports were oil and natural gas, so if we were able to control some of the supply and subsequently some of the price, Russia could say dasvidanya to their GDP growth. And what can they do? Well, not much besides make like a high schooler and complain about it on Facebook. Although, they might use thousands of bots. Now this could be particularly important because as Bloomberg reports, Russia uses their oil revenue to finance their foreign interventions in Ukraine and Syria. So if we could take control of their financing for offensive strategies, that could have a huge impact on the geopolitics of Europe and Asia. And all of this isn't even including the shot in the arm to GDP, taxable revenue, and job creation, which is a pretty good side benefit. So this brings us to question number two. How can Donald Trump raise oil production at higher rates than Obama did? Well first, let me tell you, Obama was by no metric bad for the oil industry. Right now. American oil production is the highest that it's been in eight years. That's right, eight years. Not only that, last year we relied less on foreign oil than in any of the past 16 years. Well, that is not something most people would expect to see Obama bragging about. That would be like hearing Bernie Sanders talking about how he made a killing on the stock market. So what has Trump done and is continuing to do to give us huge increases in oil production? Well, I kind of thought that this was going to be where the controversy train was going to pull into the station, because some people are not a big fan of, well, 
anything that Donald Trump touches because everything he touches seems to go to hell. He's kind of like the reverse Midas, which is kind of ironic for a man whose every room looks like a blind Midas was trying to feel his way out. So what is Donald Trump doing? Well first, he's increasing offshore drilling, an endeavor that Fox News praised and then immediately recognized the futility of. I think this is a wonderful thing. Get out there and get the resource which is ours. It belongs to us. But I don't think we're going to see much drilling with oil prices at 60 bucks a barrel. Okaying more offshore drilling might be like okaying the collection and sales of moon rocks. It wasn't the fact that it wasn't allowed that was holding people back from doing it. Trust me, if the oil industry wanted that to happen, it would have happened a while ago. Moreover, Trump is also trying to shrink a few federal monuments, but that's not really going to lead to the massive boost in production we would need to have record setting numbers. Honestly, most of it comes down to technology. We have just developed better shale technology that will allow us to pull more oil from each well than we could have done in the past. which definitely lessens the perceived environmental impact from the act of extracting more oil from the ground. Now, to sum up the Republican position, I will leave it to Reuters. The economic and political impacts of soaring US output are breathtaking. Cutting the nation's oil imports by a fifth over a decade, providing high paying jobs in rural communities, and lowering consumer prices for domestic gasoline by 37% from a 2008 peak. Well, now to the other side, because in breaking news that's surprising nobody, the New York Times isn't exactly raving about this whole thing. Now, just a fair warning, unlike everything I've reported so far, this New York Times article that I'm basing most of this off of did come from the opinion section, but it does focus more on economics than morality, so I feel comfortable talking about it. So what is this article? The rush to develop oil and natural gases we don't need. This article along with non-conservative economists are saying that this is the wrong time to be getting in the industry at the absolute worst time. It would be like me setting out right now to conquer the CD market. That said, Donald Trump wouldn't know anything about entering an industry at the wrong time launching Trump mortgage under two years before the mortgage crisis, or buying a casino in Atlantic City just before many of that city's casinos failed. <laughs> he really doesn't know how to pick them. So what industry are we talking about? Well, clearly it has to be oil, I mean that's what this episode is about. Well, no. The article is actually about the land the oil is under. Currently only half of the land being leased to energy companies is being used by those energy companies. Even further, in 2015 a record number of drilling permits on federal lands were not being used. So what purpose did it serve the US government to adopt a policy of shut up and take my federal drilling land? At this point it's like giving the former Olympic gym coach an additional one year of prison time on top of the 175 he already has for parking tickets. There's no way he's going to get through what he's already got so why even bother? Even further though, when the federal government auctions off land that nobody needs or intends to use for years or even decades, people aren't really opening up their pocketbooks to pay top dollar. In fact, last year, the energy industry bid on one third of the federal land put up for auction by the Bureau of Land Management. That's the lowest bidding rates I've seen since I looked up Bill Cosby autographed on eBay for the sake of this joke. Well, 15 items for sale and not one bid. Anyways, the federal government pushing to sell more federal land would be like China pushing to increase the number of people who live in cities by building cities in the middle of nowhere. It's just not necessary and a massive waste of land and money. Furthermore, that two thirds of land that hasn't been sold will be sold at bargain price of $2 an acre. Now, this problem is consistent with the idea that shale oil drillers are just becoming more efficient so there isn't the same demand for land. Combining everything we've talked about, if I had any advice for Trump, I'd just say leave it up to the free market and don't sell land if there is literally zero demand for it. That said, let me check my number one method for anticipating what Trump is going to do to see if this thought process will be considered. Oh no! According to the magic eight ball, he's gonna sell more land. 
His pursuit of energy dominance includes a massive fire sale of lands that will benefit speculators who don't want to pay much up front, but can leap in if the price ever increases. Thank you, and that's all I have to say about that. Hello YouTube, I hope you enjoyed that last video. For more episodes of That's All I Have to Say About That, click here. Please click here to subscribe, and remember to like below. And if you're really a fan, you can join our Facebook group. It's just a party over there.